It was one of the most eventful games I've ever been involved in. Something seemed to be happening every single second. They, were, they, they got the chance of going through, then we had. Bobnitz, the hero. Aston Villa go to Wembley. Fortunately, it worked out for us. You're looking at anything, they've got to get two to beat us. You think, well, next goal will probably see the game up. And fortunately, we got it, yeah. Locked in, a goal! The final whistle's gone. It's Aston Villa who won it as Ron Atkinson's side beats Manchester United by three goals to one. Well, let's go back to before the, the final, the semi-final against Tranmere, which in it itself turned into a, a bit of a soap opera. What are your memories of, first of all, the first leg? The first leg, the, the standout memory of that is they were leading 3 nothing, of which two of them, and I'm not being biased there, I think we're offside. I do, honestly. But, so they're 3 nothing up, and we get into the final minute of the game, Daly and Wax one in. And you would have thought, when we because, you know, small ground, when we got into there, we could, they, they were very disappointed in their dressing room. And we were like, whoa, that's great, like. And we just got beaten 3-1. Now, if they'd have known beforehand they were going to beat us 3-1, they'd have been made up. But uh, psychologically, scoring with the last kick of the match did not make a big difference. So having got that late goal there, did you click that, OK, that's something that we're going to build on for the second leg? Yeah, because basically, I mean, we're saying, look, You've got to beat them 2 nothing, which on the, on the face of it, you'd have fancied. Um, it didn't quite turn out like that, but uh, it was psychologically, it was massive. And as I say, you would have thought the way our dressing room was, instead of being down, our dressing room was bubbling and we could tell they were disappointed. So back here at Villa Park, say five, ten minutes before the game, what was the dressing room like? then because the ground must have been pumping. Yeah, we were ready for it. You know, it was one of those where it's us and them. We've got to beat, with all fairness to them, a lower division side on our own ground. And we've got to beat them by like two nothing, which didn't seem, um, you know, past the post. And we got, to, we, we actually got to two nothing quite early, I think after about 25 minutes or something. And we think, yeah, next one kills. And then they had the incident. We might have been a bit lucky when the referee um, let Mark Bosnich stay on when he could easily have sent Bosnich off when he clattered. I think it was older. he clattered. They get back to 2-1 and then it's a scrap in a game. I, I put it in the top five of games that I've managed for events, for things that went on. There was all sorts. I mean, we, we get, once again, I think Dalian scores late in the game to get us back in, to go to extra time. They had a kid who I'd had at Man U, Liam O'Brien, hit a shot that hit the post, and I can remember it trickling along the line behind Bosley and more or less hitting the other post. So everything that could have gone on, it, it was certainly one, as an eventful game I've ever been involved in, at every, every sort of emotion. And you mentioned the, the, the Bosnich incidents, um, and I was watching it on the way in here today. I mean, today he would have been sent off, wouldn't he, in the modern game. In those few moments and seconds that followed the decision, were you thinking, we're going to be down to 10, or what well, was it? Well, it was a consideration. That's why Spinky was warming up. <laughs> it was, yeah, I did, honestly, it wouldn't have surprised me to see him sent off. But uh, the re Cooper was the referee, wasn't he? Um, I think it erred on caution, and rightly so. 88th minute, had to wait for the equaliser. Did you think it wasn't going to come? Because you mentioned the, the kind of game it was where almost anything yeah, could happen. Yeah, well, you, you, you're virtually willing it to happen, and then it did happen. Now they have taken it. Dale. And it goes towards that Kingston! We go into extra time thinking, right, we'll take them apart again. And that, it didn't pan out like that. 
several close shaves either end. And then, of course, he goes to the penalties. I'm trying to think who missed. Did, did, did Kevin Richardson whack one over the bar? Uh, Richardson missed. Ekio missed. Yeah, Hugo missed, yeah. Because uh, they had a chance to win it. It went to sudden death. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and again, because Mark Boss is given the incident earlier yeah. on in the game. Well, in fact, all through that run, Bosley was outstanding. I remember seeing early on in it, we went to Sunderland and won 4 1, and they murdered us. And Bosley was man of the match by a distance. And picked up now by Armstrong and through for Gray. Marvellous, marvellous save by Bosley. Where does he pull them out from? Phil Gray looks on in amazement. He was saving, in one, uh, saving at the, the one end. And we kept getting breakaways and scoring worldies. I think he saved penalties against Tottenham. In the, Tottenham, he may have saved a penalty. I'm sure he did. Um, that season, I know for a fact, he, he was remarkable with the number of penalties he stopped. So, you know, fortunately in the final, in the semi, he managed to stop a couple. First of all, I did honestly, obviously elated from our point of view, because I, you know we're going to Wembley and that, that's a great feeling. Uh, but I did feel a bit sorry for John King, you know, and I, yeah, not too sorry, but um, I did actually. Because from his point of view, I mean, they were two minutes away from yeah. 90 minutes, and then oh. they had, I think they had two shots in the penalty yeah. shootout to win it. So you can understand him thinking, well, we, we, how do we not win that? Exactly. Oh, in all fairness, as I say, it was one of the most eventful games I've ever been involved in. There was something seemed to be happening every single second. Balance of power was going. They were they they got the chance of going through. Then we had. Um, fortunately, it worked out for us. So. And did you think, bearing in mind who you were playing in the final, that given the nature of the semi-final, sort of your name's on the cup, or not? It was, but from a few years early. <laughs> um, I don't think you think like that. I don't think you think like that. I think, A, you're just happy to get through, and then, then you start thinking about the final a bit later on. In fact, I think we started thinking about the final, one or two of our players, too early, because there, there was a dip in our league form. And maybe, just maybe, maybe I should have um, spiced it up a little bit and, put the threat on one or two, that unless they pulled the finger out, they weren't going to be playing in the final. Um, and I'll tell you what happened before the final. I went to, I went to do a game at Arsenal. Arsenal were playing, uh, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it was the previous Tuesday. Arsenal were playing Man U in a big league game. And Arsenal played with three up front, uh, Campbell, Ian Wright and Alan Smith. Didn't play with wide men, but they played with three up front and give United all sorts of problems. And I looked at that and I thought, we could do that in a slightly different way. Um, and what I, what I did need, I felt, what I did feel a bit sorry for in the final, Ray Houghton and Gary Parker have been smashing players for me for two or three years like. Um, but I looked at them and I looked at Keane, Ince, people like that, and I thought, we're going to need a physical presence in there. Andy Townsend, yeah. Rico, yeah. And that's when the Fenton thing came into play. He'd been, he'd been out on loan, I think it was Leicester and then West Brom, as a centre forward and had done very well. But he always, I always looked at him and thought, he's got, and he, even in training you could see his power. He was, and I thought, I'm going to throw him in, into the mix and just tell him to get in there and be a little bit physical. So without going to see the Arsenal game, would, would you not have had that idea? I don't know. I really don't know. That's, but it was, as I'm watching that game unfold, I'm thinking, and they played it slightly different, Arsenal. You know, their three up front were sort of narrower. But I thought if we can play, like you get Daly and Atkinson on one side, Tony Daly on the other, 
they must be the two quickest, they were the two quickest players. There's nobody quicker in the Premier at the time. And I, I remember the instructions of them were, they had Irwin and Parker at full back. I said, if you don't want to be tracking back, keep them going back. And um, to a certain extent, yeah, they did that quite well. But the game had to be won in midfield. And the other thing we did, we tried to make Cantona play the other side of our midfield. In other words, so our midfield was very often between him and the goal, because I knew Sparky, Sparky wouldn't outrun, he wouldn't outrun the, uh, our two centre-halves. But the, and I, I see him a lot, Steve, Steve Staunton was the main story. I mean, Stan, he, came, he was injured for the semi-final. And uh, he, he tells the story well about, he, even le the week leading up to the final, I'd said to him, you've got to play a game, otherwise you're not playing at Wembley. And Jim Walker, who was a brilliant physio, Jim, Jim sort of coaxed him along and in training, he, he nurtured him a little bit and eased him out of things. And he, you know, he played and he played against Kinchelskis until, and he will tell you himself, with about, I'm going to say 25 minutes left or something like that. He said, I was just stiff from the top to the bottom. He said, my legs wouldn't go any further <laughs> or any faster. So then I, that's why Coxie was sub, because I put Coxie on at right back, moved Earl across the left back to, to deal with Kinchelskis. And in terms of telling Graham, it was a big moment for him. He yeah. was a young kid at the time. Um, had, obviously, he responded fantastically. Did he exceed your expectations of how he set about that job? He did very, very well. And we didn't really tell him till. Quite late in the week, I said, hey, do you fancy a game? And he went, well, yeah. I said, well, keep yourself ready then, be ready. And uh, he was. And fortunately, as I say, he'd gone into those two loan spells at Albion and Leicester and had done well, so he got a fair bit of confidence. And uh, the one thing he didn't show on the day was any nerves whatsoever. And when did you sort of, going into the game five, 10 minutes, or when he realised this is working? I don't know if I, <laughs> I think after 90 <laughs> was when I thought it was working. Um, no, we, see, we settle in quite well. I mean, from a neutral point of view, I know the game wasn't a classic, but from our point of view, a lot of things went right for us and all right, everybody talked about him, him and him, but McGrath was unbelievable that day. All, all our players responded. The, I said to Dino, before the game, I said, your job is to, you're on your own, you're not partnering you because Dalian's moved out to the wing. Your job is to keep running, keep running and keep running behind Pallister and Brucey because they, they, they're so slow and pedestrian. <laughs> you just keep running them back, running them back, running them back. And when you're tired, we'll put somebody else on. That was the big question, who? Because I hadn't got anybody else to put on. <laughs> But uh, Dino, Dino could run for fun, yeah. And the other thing that happened before the game, and once you'd made the decision about Graham Benson and the way you were going to play, was Stan Boardman on the coach, which is, um, what, first of all, when did you have that idea? This well, it, it, when I was at Sheffield Wednesday, same final, United, and like the Sheffield boys, so they, they, were, they wouldn't mind that. So I got set to Stan, jump on the coach and come along with us. To be fair, when I was at Sheffield, he's cracking jokes, he's doing the whole, and the lads are in stitches. And I remember saying, hey, you lads, you don't think you're on a shatterbang out in or something, do you? You know, you've got, you've, got, you've got to go out and perform. Now, when he did it on our coach, on the Villa coach, the configuration was a little bit different, so it was a little bit odds and ends, you know. But, but he, where, he, where he won them over big time, because Stan was a decent player, he'll tell you that himself. He said Shankly should have signed him at uh, Liverpool and whatever. But he's got a trick where he flicks it with the back. He gets it and he can flick it around the back of his leg. And he can hit it over the bar like. And I, well, I said, well, Rico can do that without trying, you know, he can do it normally. So all the lads in the dressing room, I remember Dwight York and that, 
try, trying it. None of them could get near it. And uh, I think they, they, that, that helped in a, in a funny way, yeah. Because a lot of the players say it helped them relax. Well, that, that was the general idea. I mean, if, if you were like a United player who'd been to Wembley many times, and maybe that wouldn't have worked with them. You know, maybe you, they'd have taken that as more as a normal game. And you were playing at United side at the time they were going for a treble. So oh, you, you right. upset the apple cart It would there. probably be, looking at the team, their team, it's probably, and I think he's said this himself, Alex, it was probably the most physical team he had. I mean, he had Hughes, he had Cantona, Ensign Keane, Brucey and Pallister. You know, they were all, they were all physical players. And he, he always reckoned that was, they may have lacked, apart from in the wing, on the wing, can Chelsea and Giggsy, they may have lacked pace through the middle, but they got loads of power. And uh, that's one of the things we had to try and do, is, uh, hence the reason the kid came in, to try and match that. And when you, I mean, as I say, football, the first game, first goal rather is important. Yeah. You got the first goal there yeah. as well. How, again, how important was that in the context of the match to get the first goal? Very important. Um, you know, because hey, you're looking at them and think, they've got to get two to beat us. It's, it's, it, whether that's a negative attitude. And then you think, well, next goal will probably see the game off. If they get it, we got a problem. If we get it, we're back in the room. And fortunately, we got it, yeah. Popped in, and a goal! Saunders might well have got a touch. It was certainly a terrific free kick there. Kevin Richardson took the free kick. And they are 2-0 ahead. Again, you're 2-0 up. I presume you, you don't take things for, gra things for granted when oh, you're no. playing Manchester United. And they got it back to 2-1 late on. How many times have we seen a United equaliser in the 93rd minute, etc.? Were you worried at that stage that it was going well, to Well, when longer? you say, are you worried, you're thinking, blow up, blow up, ref. <laughs> but we don't mind you playing short time today. Mm. But... Um, but we were, still, we were still well in the game as well at that stage. I remember Bozzy making a great save at 2-1. He made one of those, he had a spell where he made miracles. You know, that's we used to look and think, well, I remember us doing a shooting exercise in training. And Dean Sanders coming out with the line, how do you beat him? I mean, he could pull, out, he could pull off saves like you couldn't believe. And um, that day he made one of those. And then you got the third, penalty, yeah, the yeah, penalty yeah, with Ken Chelsea, red card for him as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, then you must have thought, we've got this in the bag now. Were you able to enjoy it for the last few moments? Or I, thought, I thought then we were home and hosed, yeah, yeah, yeah. Atkinson bringing Daly in. Against the post, Daly and Atkinson off the line. Daly and Atkinson, I think he might have given a penalty. He's given a penalty. He's given a penalty. It's red. It's a red card. Andrei Konchelskis is off. If you wrote a script for this game, Brian, you couldn't have written it much better. Dean Saunders looking for his second goal, and Villa's third. It's 3-1 Villa. Um, and on the day, deservedly so, it wasn't as if we'd fluked it. Things went our way, I understand that, but uh, you need them to. And... Uh, Fortunately, they did. And did Sir Alex say anything afterwards? He congratulated us, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, he, he, was, he was quite gracious about it, yeah. And so when the, tell me about the, the moment when the full-time whistle goes on occasions like that, because it must be, and I know you've had a lot of experience of winning cups over the years, but that sort of split second when you hear the whistle. Yeah. No, ref, carry on. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dundale, and I'll tell you what was. I mean, we turned around, our fans were going ecstatic. We turned around, their, their fans were going home. <laughs> they, were out, they were out the stadium before, before we'd even got to our fans, like, you know. But, uh, yeah. In terms of the aftermath at Aston Villa, winning the trophy and the, and the reaction of the fans, what are your memories of that? It was brilliant. Yeah, it was great. Um, and then, I think, who did we play in midweek? Everton, I think, after the, fi after the final, yeah. And we took the, well, I, I think I took myself and that somebody else, took the trophy to the halt end and just give them a few little commands like, here are. Yeah. 
Happy days, yeah. happy days. Yeah. And what are, your, what are your memories of it in terms of your time at Aston Villa, you know, looking back at the 94 final? Was that the, the, the crown jewel moment for you or not? Uh, crown jewel? No, it was great. I mean, I've always loved... Um, look, I've always loved Wembley anyway, so I've been fairly lucky, lucky there. Um, but the year before, I'll tell you a little story about the year before when we, we were neck and neck for a long time, we united. And the, the time, the first time I, th I thought we might not win the league was, I think it was Easter Saturday. We played Coventry here, didn't play well, drew no score. Should have won, but didn't play well. As I'm coming along, walking along from the tunnel, somebody shouts, they're getting beat one nothing. They were playing Sheffield Wednesday. And it was when you used to have to go up the stairs and then just as I get to the end, somebody said they've equalised. And I said, I tell you what, they'll play till they win now. Carlton Palmer played in the game. Carlton rang me the next day. He said, uh, Trevor Francis came out with a great line to be fair. He said, they beat us in the second leg. But Carlton Palmer said he went to the, they, they switched refs or something. They had to, the linesman had to come on and ref the game or something. He said, I went to the, the, the linesman. He said, how long left? He said, two minutes of added time. And he said, six minutes later, we're still winning. And then Bruce, he gets the two goals. Like, and uh, that was the first time I thought, because I think they'd have gone. There was so much pressure on them, they had to win it. And I think if, that, if they hadn't, if those two, you know, when Kiddo and Sir Alex race onto the field at the end and, you could tell. Um, and I mean, we won the next three league games. We beat, I think it was Forest. Beat Forest at Forest. We beat Man City here. Um, who else did we beat? Beat somebody else. In, oh, I tell you, we went to Arsenal. Beat Arsenal one nothing at Highbury. But they were winning then. Because I think they had just gone, particularly in view of what had happened to them the year before. So um, and then... I just want to talk about a couple of the players that were, were out there that day. Damien Atkinson, um, obviously the goal against Wimbledon is, is fondly remembered. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that particular moment first off because it was a great goal, but nearly overtaken in, by the celebrations. Spinner get it away. Atkinson, chance to see his skill and pace. Saunders outside him, Atkinson going through on his own. Saunders to his right, tries a chip, and that's a superb individual goal by Dalian Atkinson. That's a goal fit to win any match, and he salutes the crowd as well he may. Do you know the only downside of that goal, if there is a downside of a goal? It's a pity it wasn't in one of the great stadiums. Because if that had been at Old Trafford, or Highbury, or somewhere at White Hart Lane, they would, that, they'd open every sports programme with that goal. But Dean Sanders that tells a good story about that. He said, because it was, it was a corner for them. Ball comes out, we gets cleared, Dalian latches onto it. And as he's running with it, Dino said, I'm running alongside him saying, Dalian, Dalian. He said, I'm screaming for the ball. He said, and all of a sudden, he chips the goalie. And he said, I've got to jump. Next minute, I'm jumping on him, like, you know, and then the brolly thing coming. I mean, how good would that have been in a big stadium? with a big crowd, yeah. yeah. What kind of a player was he? Because obviously he's capable of, of magic moments like that. How was he as a, as a player? Dalian, if he was, uh, if you were playing Man U, Liverpool or what, never had a problem, never had a problem. If you were playing Exeter or somebody like that away, you'd think, I wonder which Dalian's going to turn up today. You know, he loved the big occasion. And in fact, I think when he went to, when he was a, Shepherd Wednesday with me, I sold him to um, so Sociedad. And I think his best goal scoring matches, I think he got a couple at the Bernabeu against Real. He, I think he scored, scored two or three at, against Barca. I don't think he scored against anybody else. And apparently when he went to, went to Fenerbahce, didn't he? I'm trying to think, Dino went to Galatasaray. He went to Fenerbahce and they were playing each other. That is, whoa. <laughs> and apparently the, the president's son had said to him, Dalian, if you 
get two goals today. You can name any car you like. And I think after 15 minutes, so the story goes, he's already got two. <laughs> and then goes and picks a Merck Sports. Yeah. Oh, he was a character, Daly, and he was a character. Was he one of those players that you describe as a natural? Yeah, he got great physical power. He was tremendously quick. His speed was... Um, and he got a decent touch. His stamina were not great because he got a bit of um, an asthma problem. Which, but you played in bursts, and I think if he hadn't got injured the previous season when he did, he, he just scored two beauties at, uh, against Sheffield Wednesday, and we'd gone top, and we were flying. I thought him and Dino were the best two in the league as a pair, and then he didn't play again until he got injured the week before Christmas and didn't play again until Easter. And all right, we had kids coming in, like Yorkie was just starting to make his way and things like that. But, you know, I think if they'd have been allowed a few more games, we might have got out of sight, yeah. And the other player, uh, Paul McGrath, you know, you don't get called God by Villa fans for no reason at all. Um, how good was he? I don't think there's been a better central defender playing the Premiership. I don't. Um, uh, he, was, he was some man that, you know, I mean, the stories and things like that, which... There's a lot of substance too. <laughs> but um, how he went out and played, and played at the level he played, I mean, it was incredible. Very often, you know, I'd be watching a game and somebody would be attacking us and I'd think, where's he going? What's he going there for? And he had this, this knack. He seemed to attract the ball. Sometimes you thought, he's in the wrong position there. If he chip it over him, we got a problem. But they always played it into him like, you know, he, but now, whether that's great anticipation, luck, or just knowing the game, and I think it's more of the latter. And, and how was he to, to manage, and you know, how did you have to manage him? Because yeah, obviously he yeah. had his fitness issues. Yeah, well, he had to. All, all we wanted was him playing. That was the main priority. Now, I'll give you a little for instance. I took Dave Sexton on co coaching and teaching. Dave was a great coach. And the one year, Macker had only done work in the, in the gym with Jim Walker on the bike and this, that and the other. And uh, we, we went, on a, went to Germany and we're going to play Dynamo Dresden. So I said to Macker, we got, we're four weeks into preparation, season starts two weeks time. So I said to Macker, you better have a game today. And Dave's looked at me, he said, oh, you, you can't be playing him. He's got nothing under his belt, like, you know. I mean. So the first minute, the ball goes up in the air. They had a big centre forward. It, it was when East and, East and the West had joined, and I'm trying to think of the, the fellow's name. He played, he played in the German national, so Wagenhaus. I think that was his name. So the ball's up in the air. The big centre forward goes up, Mackens above him, bang! Heads it away. A few minutes later, down the side, they play one in behind him. The centre forward sets off. Macca's waiting for him. Macca's outrun him, waiting for a cigarette and bump, bang. And he's done that. Dave Sexton says to me, Ron, what he's doing? It's not possible. I said, Dave, he will do that 42 games a season. Yeah, I think, I think he only missed two games in the four years. I think it was only himself. And, he got a record in the Premiership himself, and I think it's Peter Atherton um, were the same, something like that. But in, in and I mean, <laughs> before a game, he'd be in the dressing room, and he'd be saying to Jim Walker, because Jim used to relate the stories back to me, he'd say, Jim, I, I don't think I can go out like you, and you know, the, the knee's gone, and this and the other, and he's stiff, and Jim said, as soon as they get out there, Mac, and let them chant your name, he said, the adrenaline will get you going. <laughs> it, I mean, in all fairness, he was voted the Players Player of the Year in, in 92, 90, 93, I think it was. Yeah. He seemed to be one of those players, you mentioned earlier, maybe luck or judgment, but he seemed to be a very intelligent player with the ability to be in the right place at the right time. He was, but I'll tell you what people didn't realise about Macca. He weren't half quick, you know. 
People used to say, ah, oh, he reads the game well. He was lightning. When, when before, when, when I was, say when I was at United, when I had him as a kid, Ian Rush used to say, I run past this fella, and by the time I get to the penalty area, he's waiting for me. You know, he was very quick, he got great body strength. You know, he, he was, uh, and as a lad, the quietest lad, you, you, um, you never ever, he hardly spoke, he hardly, yeah, never got a peep out of him hardly. Um, <laughs> at the character. And you know that he has this thing, and the, the fans used to think it was a, say the ball went wide and he got played in, he'd jump up in the air and always with his right foot would back heel it. He used to get up in the air and back heel it, and everybody used to think it was class. He, what it was, he couldn't stand on his right foot to hit it with his left foot. <laughs> So he compensated with that, and everybody thought it was a, a great bit of controlling class, like. Yeah. So I want to talk about the, the club in general. Uh, obviously, your era was, um, you know, trophies and, and European yeah. football, and now Villa seem to be touch wood, cross fingers, on their way back to that great place in the league, still going well yeah. in Europe. Uh, how do you sort of see Aston Villa now? When oh, but I, I, the funny old thing is, you know, convincing people. But not people here in this area, but outside this area, what a massive club the Villa is. I think now they've got, they've got a fair amount of backing. They've got a decent squad. I would have to say the performance, I mean, I've been watching Villa, like I said to you earlier, for I think it was 70 odd years ago since I saw my first game, more than that. And I've never seen a better Villa performance from any team, the team that won the Euro. European Cup, my team, whatever, than when they beat Man City here the other week. I looked at that and I thought, that is some performance, you know, because Man City are the epitome of what a team is and they just blew them off the park. And uh, I think they're on the right lines. But the, the other thing they've got, they seem as if they've got a fairly, fairly manageable squad. You know, they're not down to sort of 14, bare bones and after that they're throwing youth players in. Uh, I think, um, and obviously the managers, the managers got heaps of experience at all levels, particularly the European level, you know, he's got a hell of a CV in that. So I think, to quote, the future's bright.